Uh, today, we have the last, uh, last presenter, whose name is Mark, Dr. Mark Pierce, a PhD candidate. Uh, he is a director of Ellen White Research Center at Avondale University. He previously served as a minister, professor, and having various experience for several years. Today, he will present about uh, the title is uh, Divine Inspiration and the Staff of Ellen White Estate, 1930 to uh, 1970. Welcome. You may have uh, 45 minutes. Good morning, everyone, or at least it's morning here in Australia, where it's just after 6 a.m. Or good evening to you where you are. The default position of many Christians on inspiration appears to be verbalism unless they have thought about it. It should come as no surprise then that this was very likely the perspective of many Seventh-day Adventists and that this viewpoint was held by a number at the highest echelons of the denomination. It could be speculated that this position was held by those who worked for the Ellen G. White publications, as it was then known. A deeper dig into the personalities who worked there after the passing of W.C. White will, however, reveal a rather different perspective. In particular, it will show that Arthur L. White held and maintained thought inspiration as the modus operandi of inspired writers, and that this was how inspiration worked in the life and ministry of his grandmother, Ellen G. White. This paper will explore the understanding of inspiration and how it worked held by individuals who were employed either as secretary or as associate secretaries at the Ellen G. White estate up to 1970. The Seventh-day Adventist yearbooks for the period have no entry for Ellen G. White publications prior to 1935. William C. White is listed as a secretary from 1935 to 1937, with Arthur L. White recorded as associate secretary and treasurer. After the death of his father, Arthur White is listed as, alone as secretary between 1938 and 1950. Dora Z. Robinson becomes associate secretary from 1951 to 1953, though there is evidence that he was back working with the estate in the 1930s and 40s, having previously served as a missionary in Southern Africa. Further, being a son-in-law of W.C. White, he had worked for Ellen White before her death, and his return sees him working with his brother-in-law, Arthur White. Denton E. Reebok was both president of the board and an associate secretary in 1952, with T. Housel Jemison an associate secretary in 1953-54. 1955 sees Arthur White again on his own, but he is joined by D. Arthur Delafield in 1956, who remained with the estate through the remainder of the period. Bessie Mount appears as an assistant secretary in 1962 and remains so through 1967. That same year, a branch office of the White Estate was opened at Andrews University and Hedwig Jemison was named as the assistant secretary. She remained in that role throughout the period. Another addition to the White Estate staff occurs in 1968 when Paul Gordon is named as an assistant secretary. The last three personnel will not be covered in this paper either because their roles were less significant or they commenced toward the end of the period. It should be noted that presidents or chairman of the board and other board members and trustees are not covered because they were not involved in the day-to-day -day activities of the estate. Therefore, this paper will focus on Arthur L. White, Doris E. Robinson, Denton E. Reebok, T. Housel Jemison, and finally D. Arthur Delafield. It will show that Arthur White consistently held and espoused the model of thought inspiration, that Robinson was likely the same, that Reebok held a similar perspective during his tenure, and that this is rather less than clear for Jemison and Delafield. So to Arthur L. White. Grandson of Ellen G. White, he became the secretary of the Ellen G. White estate on the passing of his father, William Clarence White, in 1937. His work made him a regular contributor to Ministry magazine in his early years in the role. 
sometimes publishing series of articles over many months. It is likely there was consultation with him regarding articles that were drawn from the corpus of Ellen White's writings. In 1944, he published a series of articles under the general title, The Prophetic Gift in Action. It is noteworthy that two articles by Ellen White on the inspiration of the Bible writers were published in the same journal. The first in the issue prior to this series. In them, she takes a position that is not in favour of verbal inspiration, stating, quote, It is not the words of the Bible that are inspired, but the men that were inspired. Inspiration acts not on the man's words or his expressions, but on the man himself, who, under the influence of the Holy Ghost, is imbued with thoughts, end quote. Hence, her, under, her stated understanding was that of thought inspiration rather than a form of verbal inspiration. Arthur White, working closely with her writings, would be quite aware of her stance and would be expected to adopt a similar perspective. This is evident in the second article of his series when he asserts, quote, Some have been of the opinion that there was a mechanical force which guided the pen which she held in her hand. Such a view is also entirely out of harmony with the facts. The revelation consisted in the enlightening of the mind, and then, when not in vision, it was the task of the prophet, with the aid of the Spirit of God, of course, to pass on to others instruction, admonition, and information of divine origin which she had received. End quote. Later he refers to Ellen White's writings, asserting, quote, Earnestly, she sought to set forth the divinely imparted thoughts and ideas in words which would correctly and adequately convey the thought in such a way that it could not be misunderstood, end quote. Clearly, he denies verbal inspiration, endorsing thought inspiration instead. That is maintained in a letter answering questions on inspiration in White's writing some two years later. He wrote that, to perceive her as, quote, merely an automaton recording or uttering orally words which were given to her to pass on to others, end quote, would lead such persons to have difficulties both with the Bible and with the spirit of prophecy. Here he had historical precedent on which to ground his concern. Furthermore, in 1956, White issued Ellen G. White, Messenger to the Remnant, under the Ellen G. White publications in Premature. This book consisted of five previously published pamphlets which constituted articles written by Arthur White that had originally appeared in Ministry, beginning in 1935. Some minor editions were also made. His articles in The Prophetic Gift in Action made up the first section. The book was republished essentially unchanged in 1959, 1965 and 1969, the last credited to a different publisher. This means that White's understanding of inspiration and how it worked was settled when he first published these articles in the 1940s and remained constant thereafter. That is further demonstrated in his Notes and Papers Concerning Ellen G. White and the Spirit of Prophecy, first published in 1955 for a seminary course on prophetic guidance, which he taught. There were seven printings of this work, the last being in 1974. The initial publication opens with Henry Alford's Inspiration of the Evangelists and Other New Testament Writers, where he denies the verbal inspiration theory vis-a-vis -vis scripture, and also contains F.M. Wilcox's 1946 General Conference Morning Devotional, that denied the verbal inspiration of Ellen White's writings. Significantly, the 1957 edition opens with White's introduction to her work, The Great Controversy, which shows she espoused thought inspiration, as well as other additional statements she made on the subject. It maintains Alfred's chapter, as well as Will Cox's devotional, then adds a section from D.E. Reebok's presentation at the 1952 Bible Conference, where he shows White denied infallibility and verbal inspiration, but claimed thought inspiration. Additionally, Ellen White's 1906 letter to Dr. Paulson is added, in which she emphatically denies that everything she spoke or wrote 
quote, under any and all circumstances, was as inspired as the Ten Commandments, end quote. Other additional material on how to use White's writings was also added. Each edition retained Ellen White's material on inspiration and Alfred's chapter on the same subject. Wilcox's devotional is absent from the 1962 edition onward, as is Reebok's section on inspiration. The 1971 edition is a significant expansion adding material on White's inspiration. The 1974 edition has extra material from White's writings on inspiration that appeared as section one in the compilation Selected Messages, volume one in 1958, along with some extracts from section three of the same work. Other documents added included the following, Uriah Smith's editorial, which are revealed words or ideas, from the March 13, 1888 Review and Herald, along with an ex excerpt from the 1883 General Conference Action Affirming Thought Inspiration, and two articles by Arthur White, the first of which was a 1971 paper on the relationship of the Bible to Ellen White's writings from the perspective of the Adventist pioneers, and the second being a 1953 paper on Ellen White's counsel regarding English versions of the Bible. Further, this edition was restructured by placing the matter in sections with all the material in, on inspiration placed in the first section under that heading. In 1958, Arthur White published a document titled The Vital Importance of an Understanding of Inspiration. In it, he acknowledges that some Seventh-day Adventists had a concept of mechanical verbal inspiration. Given later conflicts, this would appear to be a substantial understatement, particularly given Roger Kuhn's assessment of a crisis of hermeneutic in 1982. Significantly, he went on to assert that those who did this claimed for Ellen White more than she ever claimed for the Bible, for herself or her writings. Thus, the understanding of inspiration had direct consequences for the perception of the role and authority of Ellen White's writings, though Arthur White does not identify those issues with one exception, the case of Dudley M. Canwright. Here, his point is that a failure to understand how inspiration worked in Ellen White's ministry would lead to rejecting her claims to the prophetic gift. Hence, he referred to Henry Alford's assertion that Quote, we must take our views of inspiration not from a priori considerations, but entirely from the evidence furnished by the scriptures themselves, end quote. This line he would maintain throughout the rest of his tenure. The 1973 book, The Ellen G. White Writings, perhaps represents Arthur White's fullest explanation of his understanding of Ellen White's writings. It is made up of presentations he made between 1965 and 1968 in various settings, though they were edited somewhat for this work. It has a three-item appendix, the second of which is the material by Alford in Notes and Papers. Arthur White adds an, an editorial note on its importance in which he asserted that, quote, when Ellen White was living, her staff considered the Henry Alford statement on the inspiration of the evangelists and other New Testament writers to be of great value in that he seemed to grasp a concept of inspiration that is well supported by the facts they were familiar with, as demonstrated in the work of Ellen G. White. The White estate staff through the years has reached similar conclusions, end quote. <clears throat> this demonstrates comprehensively that his concept of inspiration was the thought-based model and had remained so consistently during his tenure. Thus, when charges of plagiarism and questions over Ellen White's inspiration caused significant agitation in the 1970s and 1980s, he was bemused given the emphasis of his work and publications. In 1982, White expressed his frustration that the import of articles and papers that had been published or, re or released had not been understood. When the matter became a pub matter of public attention, he would refer to those publications and often got the response, oh yes, is that what you were talking about? 
In summary, it can be concluded that Arthur White consistently espoused a thought-based model of inspiration for scripture and for the writings of Ellen G. White. This understanding was remarkably consistent through his tenure and in his publications. Doris Eugene Robinson worked for, the Ellen White, worked for Ellen White at Elmshaven prior to her death, and after that served for a time as a missionary in Southern Africa. Upon his return, he again assisted Willie White at Elmshaven and then worked for the General Conference after the White publications moved there. While it has been challenging to ascertain what Robinson's view of inspiration was, it is clear that he believed in and sustained a providential view of history. In commenting on the establishment of the American Medical Missionary College at Battle Creek in 1895, he wrote that, quote, a divine providence had been going before them and would continue to guide them as they followed his providential leading, end quote. Robinson had, on numerous occasions in the preceding chapter, referred to counsel from Ellen White, who was in Australia, that urged the establishment of just such an institution for the training of Adventist medical personnel. Thus, it is clear that he believed that the leadership was following inspired counsel, though his understanding of how White was inspired is not delineated. However, later in reference to the arrival of a letter from Ellen White, who was in Australia, in time for meetings at the 1897 General Conference session, Robin quote, Robinson quotes John Harvey Kellogg thus, quote, I believe that every person here has faith and confidence that the words that I am going to read to you are from the Lord, that they came from divine inspiration, that they are the result of inspiration, that they are instruction sent to us, which we ought to receive, end quote. While this may show that Kellogg had a verbalist view of inspiration, its, cita its citation does not prove that was also true of Robinson, because he is not dealing specifically with inspiration, and because it was relatively common to refer to the words of scripture to contrast one's position from that of modernists or liberals. Robinson refers to divine counsel, divine plans, being divinely led, when describing White's role in the establishment of medical training institutions in California, and what he described as White's desire that, quote, the medical workers might be trained after the divine pattern, end quote. He believes that it was under divine guidance that White received the health emphasis that was to influence and impact the Adventist church. Yet none of this reveals his understanding of inspiration, it does indicate his perspective on White's authority because he clearly believed that what she said and the counsel she gave was from God. Thus, when she spoke on matters relating to spirituality, theology, and the church, God was speaking through her. One document that likely indicates that he held to a thought inspiration view is brief statements regarding the writings of Ellen G. White, which he co-authored with W.C. White, and was originally published in 1933. Referring to Ellen White, this comment is made regarding the challenge she faced in putting what she had shown into human language. Quote, in her early experience, when she was sorely distressed over the difficulty of putting into human language the revelations of truth that had been imparted to her, she was reminded of the fact that all wisdom and knowledge comes from God, and she was assured that God would bestow grace and guidance. She was told that in the reading of religious books and journals, she would find precious gems of truth expressed in acceptable language, and that she would be given help from heaven to recognize these and to separate them from the rubbish of error with which she would sometimes find them associated, end quote. Later, they write, quote, Mrs. White read such books as she considered would be helpful to her in acquiring skill, in presenting in clear, forceful language the instruction she had to give, end quote. Further, there is later reference to the 1883 General Conference Resolution that specifically refers to imparting the thoughts when the inspired writer received revelations. These sentiments seem to rule out verbal inspiration and lean to thought inspiration. Given that Robinson worked with Ellen White when she was living, and that he also collaborated 
collaborated with W.C. White in his work and later worked with Arthur White, who also held a thought view of inspiration, the evidence would appear to point in the same direction for him. Denton E. Reebok and T. Housel Jemison. Both these gentlemen served for a time as associate secretaries of the Alan G. White publications, as it was then known, and both also had books published in the 1950s that dealt with inspiration and the role of Ellen White. Jemison also authored a college textbook, Christian Beliefs, in 1959. Consequently, their statements on these matters can be presumed to be not only acceptable to the church, but also to the Ellen G. White publications. Denton Reebok. Reebok made a series of four presentations at the 1952 Bible Conference titled The Spirit of Prophecy in the Remnant Church. In the last of these, he addresses the matter of inspiration vis-a-vis -vis White's writings and the Bible. Quote, Ellen G. White never claimed verbal inspiration for either her own writings or the Bible itself. Neither did she ever claim infallibility for herself nor for the men who gave us the Bible, end quote. He then went on to assert that, quote, some of our people must clarify their thinking and bring themselves into accord and agreement with Ellen G. White, whom they so ardently support, end quote. Thus, he was aware that there were Seventh-day Adventists who were claiming too much both for White, both for the Bible and White regarding inspiration and infallibility. As a result, they were setting themselves up for challenges and difficulties, which became very much apparent when questions were raised about White's inspiration in the 1970s. Reebok concluded, quote, It thus becomes apparent that Alan G. White, A, never claimed infallibility, either for herself or for the writers of the scriptures, God alone is infallible, B, never claimed verbal inspiration for her, her own writings, nor for the scriptures, C, did claim thought inspiration both for her own writings and for the scriptures, D, did not look upon her writings as commandments of God, but saw them as reproofs, counsels, warnings, encouragements, messages, testimonies, cautions, end quote. In his Believe His Prophets, these same sentiments are repeated. The Bible is, quote, the Bible is not verbally inspired and neither are the writings of Ellen G. White, end quote. Thus, his viewpoint is consistent in opposing verbal inspiration, both for scripture and White, instead espousing thought inspiration. T. Housel Jemison. <clears throat> Jemison's emphasis on words in the divine communication process that was evident in his college textbook is found in his A Prophet Among You, unsurprisingly, given it was published first. In reference to biblical prophets, he claimed, quote, when these men were moved by the Holy Spirit to speak, they gave their messages as words from God, end quote. In discussing Jeremiah's work, he describes it as, God, quote, fulfilling the prophecy of Deuteronomy 18, 18, that he would put his words into the mouth of the prophet and that the messenger should speak all that he was commanded, end quote. In commenting on Paul's declaration on inspiration, inspiration Jemison states, quote, all scripture is God breathed, is the way Paul expressed it originally. It is not the thought God breathed his message only into man, but that he breathed it out or spoke it out through man as his agent. Peter's words should be put along with Paul's. He quotes 2 Peter 1.21. God's word spoken at the prompting of the Holy Spirit was the message of the prophets. They could recognize no other source, end quote. Thus for Jemison, the words and the message that inspired the writer delivered are one and the same. Nevertheless, Jemison's understanding of inspiration appears at best to be in a state of flux between verbalism and thought inspiration, especially given that he cites as, as authorities Louis Gowson, Carlisle Haynes and Benjamin Warfield in his recommended reading. This is evidenced in that at least in some instances, the term message could be substituted for words 
and it would not change the meaning of the sentence. And here I want to do a quick share screen if I can find um, this and show you exactly what I mean. Um, unaware as they were many times of the real significance of the words they were to deliver, could read, unaware as they were of the real... Now, I better do that again. Unaware as they were many times of the real significance of the message they were to deliver, and it would convey precisely the same meaning. So what I'm basically saying here is if we were to just change that words to message, we would get exactly the same meaning in the sentence. It is therefore suggested that while Jemison appears to emphasize words, it is the message which the prophet carries that he intends his reader to understand. This would then align with his use of the 1883 General Conference Resolution, which he quotes in full, that specifically affirms thought inspiration and his denial of verbal dictation inspiration. The textbook, Christian Beliefs, issued by the General Conference Education Department in 1959, does little to clarify Jemison's position. His understanding of inspiration there was, quote, that the Holy Spirit exercised control over the production of the original manuscripts of the Old and New Testament. This control resulted in the scriptures becoming for mankind an unerring and sufficient guide to salvation, end quote. His use of the stronger word control rather than White's more moderate guided in reference to the role of the Holy Spirit in the inspiration process suggests overtones of the verbalist view. This is evidenced by his emphasis on words. Quote, God chose to convey his thought through the prophet's words. Thus the words of men became the word of God. The message of God expressed in the words of the prophet under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit became the word of God, end quote. This stress on words could be understood as supporting a verbalist perspective, but this is an uncertain understanding given he previously worked for the wider state and his book, A Prophet Among You. There he stated, quote, God's word spoken at the prompting of the Holy Spirit was the message of the prophets, end quote. It is possible that Jemison was intending to emphasize the trustworthiness and reliability of White's message in an intentional contrast with modernism liberalism outside the church and potential indifference to her writings inside the church, and hence his emphasis on words. Thus, while he understood that it was the message that was paramount, as did others in the same decade, he emphasized words, thereby being rather less than clear. In contrast, Denton Reebok has a similar emphasis on words, as is seen in his reference to Jeremiah's message to King Jehoiakim and Nathan's message to David, but is more evidently of the thought inspiration view. Regarding White's writings, he refers to the, quote, 25 million words she wrote four times. Let me um, stop there and go back over that. Regarding White's writings, he refers to the 25 million words she wrote four times, yet here, yet we have seen that Reebok did not espouse verbal inspiration. This later he makes abundantly clear. Quote, we must ever remember that the power to inspire is not wrapped up in the words themselves, but in the God who inspired the messenger with his thoughts and then left the human agent to find the human words to give expression to those inspired thoughts. End quote. Thus, his emphasis on words should be understood to be in reference to the message that the words convey. However, it is probable that this nuance could have been lost on many readers and listeners. It should be evident that the understanding of inspiration Jemison was advocating was not clear and distinct. While divine inspiration was strongly advocated and defended, the model that Ellen White operated under was not clearly outlined. 
This may have been a concession to the time in which he wrote, given that there were many in the Adventist church who did believe in verbal inspiration and the fact that there were still current Adventist publications that supported that view. Conversely, it is plausible that Jemison himself had not clarified his own thinking, possibly in part due to his being predominantly an educator and only spending a short period with their, the Ellen G. White publications. Perhaps it is more likely that Jemison and many others from this period were still impacted by the perceived threat of modernism and consequently used language that clearly differentiated themselves from it, though it was a legacy of the mon fundamentalist modernist conflict. Yet at the same time, they were using language that did not distinguish them from verbalism. D. Arthur Delafield commenced work for the White Estate in 1956 and completed his working life there. His view of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and its place in history is demonstrated partly in his report on the 1952 Bible Conference. There, commenting on L. E. Froome's presentations, in which Froome asserted that Adventism had been built on the generations of Christians that had gone before, Delafield wrote that Froome had, quote, sketched for us the absorbing picture of the temple of truth God has been building through the ages, with the Advent message firmly settled on the top as the gleaming tower of the superstructure. End quote. He further asserted that the quote, third angel's message did not originate in the mind of extremists, but in the mind of God. End quote. This describes his perspective of the role of the Seventh day Adventist Church in salvation history. And his four references to Ellen White's writings suggest something of his esteem for her ministry. Further, in the 1962 Spirit of Prophecy Day sermon, Delafield recounts an anecdote that portrays his attitude to what he believed the pioneers had discovered from the gold mine of scripture and anyone who was perceived to challenge those beliefs. He refers to a sermon by a minister on the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation and their being fulfilled after which a saintly old man came and said, quote, we have a wonderful church because it has a wonderful foundation, which is deep, square and level. No other foundation can any man lay than that is laid. The remarkable thing about the foundation is the fact that the mortar was wet with the tears and perspirations of the pioneers. Woe unto him who moves a block or stirs a peg, end quote. While this does not address his understanding of White's inspiration, it is very clear on his view of her authority and one that was fostered by the White estate. This is borne out by his following comment relative to White and the Bible conferences of 1848. Quote, the spirit of truth was present in these meetings to seal the doctrines home to the hearts of all, end quote. There follows an extended quote from White's counsels to writers and editors, where she states in part, quote, when the power of God testifies as to what is truth, that truth is to stand forever as the truth. No after suppositions contrary to the light God has given are to be entertained, end quote. <clears throat> in his 1948 God's Way Out, Delafield described the Bible as true from cover to cover all true he goes on to assert that quote if any one of the 66 books 1189 chapters or 31173 verses were otherwise the light of the bible would have dimmed out centuries ago and the world would have been left in darkness end quote this seems to imply a verbalist approach because he goes from the big to the small in asserting that it is all true. However, he then qualifies his meaning when he writes, quote, every thought expressed and every historical fact recorded 
is true, all true, end quote. The moderation is evidenced in his use of thought expressed, leaving it unclear what he understood on inspiration. Delafield's other published work, Alan G. White and the Seventh-day Adventist Church, does not address the issue of inspiration directly. Other than asserting that scripture is inspired and that White was inspired, there's no discussion of how inspiration worked or whether it was verbal or thought inspiration or indeed some other method of inspiration. While he notes that White, quote, championed the scriptures as the final court of appeal in all doctrinal questions, end quote, his very next chapter is titled An Inspired Commentary on the Bible. He describes her as giving, quote, deeply spiritual insights, unquote, on scripture, but does not address the question of the authority of those insights against scripture itself, whether they are determinative on the meaning of scripture or whether other sincere believers can have spirit enlightened insights and what the relationship between them would be. Thus, while he sees scripture as the final court of appeal, he does not delineate how that interfaces with White being an inspired commentary on scripture. Conclusion. It should be evident that the staff of the Ellen G. White estate generally held to a thought-based model of inspiration. This is clearly the case with long-serving secretary Arthur L. White and likely was the case with Doris E. Robinson and Denton E. Reebok. Exactly where T. Housel Jemison and D. Arthur L. Delafield stood is somewhat more difficult to ascertain. What is certain is they all believed in her inspiration and that she was led by God. Further, Arthur White, Robinson and Reebok draw attention to the human element in inspiration, whereas Jemison and Delafield highlight the certain reliability of her statements. Nonetheless, it is likely that all of them, it is likely that for all of them, it also meant that her authority was unquestionable because she was led by God. That meant that when she spoke, God spoke. The practical outcome of this was that while White Estate staff presented a thought-based model of White's inspiration to the church, this was largely negated due to the effective message being that God was speaking through Ellen in whatever she said or wrote. Everything that she was viewed as from God and therefore authoritative, thereby strangling attempts to portray her inspiration as thought-based. Thus, the portrayal of her perceived authority and status neutralized attempts to educate members about how her inspiration functioned. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Dr. Uh, Dennis Kaiser will respond to his paper. Uh, Dr. Kaiser is a professor of Samstead Adventist Seminary at Andrews University and the director of this symposium. He is uh, also participating on uh, several editing projects. Uh, Dr. Kaiser, you have 10 minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark, for your um, interesting presentation. And um, um, I was trying to find a different respondent and after several attempts, uh, eventually I decided that I do it because several people declined, so. In that sense, uh, you're stuck with me. Huh? But I have already sent a couple of things beforehand before I knew that I would respond to um, to Mark Pierce. If you were to have visited the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the 1960s and 1970s, you may have discovered that the theory of verbal inspiration was quite prevalent in the pew. I'm not saying this from, from my own experience because I was just born in the late 1970s. This is based on what I heard from others. Yeah. Um, so it was more a widespread view in that sense. Yeah? As a result of the research in the academic discipline of Ellen White's studies in the last couple of decades, we know that this theory stands in contrast to both Ellen White's own perspective and also her experience. We wonder 
how this misconception that Ellen White was verbally inspired and that she claimed verbal inspiration could have arisen. Of course, it's well possible that this idea has always existed within Adventism, and research seems to prove that it has been present among Adventists, although it was not the only perspective among us. There were others. Yeah? And so the 1883 General Conference session, uh, where they um, passed a resolution, um, I think that is one example among others that shows that that Adventists, um, at least officially, uh, formed more a thought inspiration model. Yeah? Although, and here's a slight side note, um, I think that's one thing that is often overlooked. That resolution affirms that uh, the Holy Spirit in general uh, inspires thoughts and impresses thoughts, but in very rare cases, it may also give words. Yeah? So in that sense, I think it's more a consensus statement than just a one-sided affirmation there that we see there, yeah? which may imply that there were different views among Adventists on this topic. So it appears that Adventism had an affinity for the fundamentalist movement during the 1920s to 1940s, and some scholars have surmised that the church shifted toward verbal inspiration during that period. And so some assume that the white estate, as the official keeper and promoter of Ellen White's legacy, was somehow involved in that shift or at least supportive of it. You know? Now, by trying to answer the question whether the staff of the Ellen White estate from 1930 to 1970 advocated verbal inspiration, Mark Pierce has thus chosen an interesting and relevant subject. He has shown quite convincingly that Arthur White and Denton E. Rebock clearly opposed the idea that Ellen White was verbally inspired or that she had claimed verbal inspiration. So it's very clear that they were opposed to that idea. And I think that uh, Mark's study has the potential to fill up this lacuna in Avena studies that um, is the quest for the roots of this theory in Adventism. So basically the question, like why did people in the 1960s, 1970s believe in verbal inspiration? Um, and because our knowledge of the time before Elmite's death is more comprehensive than about the people period from the 1920s to 1940s. Um, and we see that there is a stronger fundamentalist influence in the church. So therefore people assume this is where it all started. Yeah. So, um, so while his paper does not intend to answer the question why verbal inspiration was a widespread assumption among Adventists in the pew, it does a very good job to show that the root of the problem was not the Almighty state, at least not directly. Yeah? So we have to look elsewhere for an answer. I think that's uh, like, if there is any contribution, that's a contribution of this paper, among others. Yeah? But I think that's an important one that it basically excludes possibilities here. Yeah? Now, I have a couple recommendations to make. Um, and I believe that Mark Pierce's case could be strengthened in several ways. And I will list a few of them here. Maybe he, um, feels that some of them have already been addressed um, in the meantime. And so then that, that's also fine with me. Yeah? So to access D.E. Robinson's view of inspiration, um, Mark Pierce looks only at, uh, it seems to me, only at the story of our health message, which provides only a little information about his view of, um, about uh, Robinson's view of inspiration. And then he looks also at a document that Robinson co-authored with his father-in-law, W.C. White. Now, given his extended work for the Ellen White estate, I could imagine that the question answer files contain some letters from Robinson on the subject of Ellen White's inspiration. And so therefore, um, I would suggest maybe to go to the uh, website ellenwhite.org um, and there to the question and answer or the resource section and then to search in the question answer files and see if there's anything that was written by D.E. Robertson on this question. Yeah? Because then we have, um, say, um, a better foundation on, on this topic regarding Robinson's personal view. Yeah? Now, while um, Mark did not find many helpful statements in the writings of T. Housel Jemison and D.E. Delafield, um, since he was primarily looking at their books on the subject, I wonder if there aren't any articles which uh, would shed more light on their views 
that one might find, for example, in the periodical database of the General Conference uh, Office of Archive Statistics and Research. So I could imagine that looking there, uh, we might actually find something. Yeah? Um, right, then um, Mark's study may illustrate another point, important aspect that I think he could stress more. Um, in the way we have often talked about Elamite, we have emphasized the trustworthiness of her writings and the messages they contain. I think there's nothing wrong about this. However, if we do not couple such statements with clarifications about the way the Holy Spirit operates in the experience of the human participant, so the prophet, yeah, in a dynamic, multifaceted way that is not dominating and rigid, but cooperative, wooing, appealing to the conscience of the human participant and inviting the human participant uh, into a cooperation and so on. Then readers, uh, if we don't include these things, then readers may simply make up their own mind how that trustworthy and reliable result came about. And in that way, if the emphasis is only on trustworthiness and reliability, it may cause people to look for the theory that most perfectly seems to guarantee that outcome. And that would be verbal inspiration, because that theory seems to guarantee a trustworthy and reliable outcome, because there is not much, uh, or it appears that there is not much uh, influence from the human side. Yeah? Yet frequently, those with unrealistic views about Ellen White experience then a culture shock when they discover that Ellen White does not meet the standard of their richer view of inspiration, and as a result, they reject her. Yeah? So thus, inadvertently, we may strengthen misconceptions about her inspiration, which in the end may turn out counterproductive. Yeah? So Mark's comments on Jemison's statements concerning Ellen White's writings as an inspired commentary may illustrate that point. And what I mean here is that we use imprecise language. Yeah? By leaving that phrase largely undefined, it leaves readers with a gap that they will likely fill in their own minds. At times, we use the same language, like an inspired commentary, um, but fill it with different meanings. One person may talk about her writings as an inspired commentary, pointing to her as the final, exhaustive, comprehensive, definitive interpreter of the Bible, where the text cannot mean anything else. And so I think that's uh, what we deem as problematic. You know? On the other hand, another person may use the term inspired commentary simply in the sense that Ellen White was inspired when she commented on scripture. She commented on scripture. We have books like uh, The Desire of Ages, Thoughts on the Blessing, Patriots and Prophets, and so on. You know, it would go on. There are several books where she comments on scripture, and she claimed inspiration for those writings. So in that sense, aren't those writings an inspired commentary? But the question is, what does that mean? Even though she claimed inspiration for her comments on scripture, she never intended to offer the final exhaustive and comprehensive meaning of the text, since she believed that scripture contains an eternal depth of meaning that cannot be exhausted. So the understanding of the term inspired commentary depends a lot on the person's view of inspiration and understanding of uh, the clarity of inspired writings. It would certainly be interesting to dig deeper into how the White Estate staff perceived Ellen White's role and biblical interpretation and the extent of her authority on this matter. Yet this would have added another research question and expanded the research. I suggest that this could be the focus of another paper or alternatively in preparation of this paper for publication, Mark might want to expand his paper to include that aspect as well. Yeah? But this might be too much as well. Yeah? So finally, I want to commend Mark Pierce for his nice research um, his excellent research and for showing that for decades the Elmine estate tried uh, opposing and debunking the prevalent belief in Elmine's verbal inspiration. It appears that at least in some quarters of Adventism, they were not very successful to convince people of the wrongness of their view. What were the reasons? Well, this paper cannot answer those reasons. This is the question of a larger study or for a larger study, but Mark could make some suggestions in his paper as to the possible reasons. Thank you, Mark. And uh, I think my time is also up. Thank you. Thank you for response. Okay, Mark, you 
have five minutes to reply for it. Um, yes, thanks, Dennis. I really do appreciate your feedback. Um, I was pleasantly surprised to see you listed as a respondent too, I'd have to say. You, um, with Robinson, you're quite right that I did focus on story of our health message and the Willie White document that he co-authored. Um, I really struggled to find anything else on him. Um, whether there's anything in the Q&A files on the White Estate website, I don't know. Um, I will have to look there. I think that is a good observation. On Delafield and whether there's more in the GC archives, I did uh, use Eric Lowe's um, data that we have in the um, hard drive format, and I browsed through a number of articles looking for what Delafield may have written or said, and most of what I could find on Delafield in articles in the review or wherever were reports on what he did, not what he said. Um, but I did not do the same thing with Jemison. Whether there's more in the Q and A files on the White Estate website, I don't know. I think your point of the trustworthiness of Alan's writings um, needs to be coupled with how the spirit works with the human participant in the inspiration process is actually a very, very good point. We need to be precise in the language that we use um, because that helps our people and I think it helps us in in a, a correct understanding of how inspiration worked in Alan's writings. Um, and the last point that, that I have here that I think is worth digging into, although probably not in this paper, <clears throat> is what is meant by that term inspired commentary. <clears throat> I think you're finding the nuances there uh, or suggesting that there are nuances there is actually very a very good point, um, probably because in my own perception to hear that term, I have assumed that for people that means, well, in the inspired commentary is the final word, <laughs> but is that what is meant is perhaps a very good question to ask and even to ask what did the white estate staff mean if they did use the term <laughs> thank you <laughs>